Hi, and welcome back to the channel. Thank you very much for joining me. And as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned in my last video, um, I'm I'm making this this particular video episode, whatever you want to call it, um, really in in response to to many requests I've had. Most recently, uh, I will uh, give my plug, Marco Ensing. Who um, who asked about my turntable, what make, model, blah 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 blah. He couldn't find it. Uh, looking around and about, he couldn't work out what it was. And maybe the reason for that is it's uh, it's actually a discontinued model. It's no longer in production uh, because I've had it for. Um, let me just check on that one. Um, Sixteen years. So uh, anyway. So what I thought I would do is actually run through my entire hi-fi system. Um, some might call it a hi-fi system, some might call it a reference system. It's definitely used for my work. And actually, uh, I kind of ought to explain a little bit about what I do for work, because that will explain why I have the system that I've got. Uh, and in some respects, how, how I can afford to have it. Um, so if we go all the way back to... Um, 1987 so 35 years ago uh, just under 34 years ago I was working as a graphic designer and um, that was my first job after leaving university and it just began to grate on me so uh, after chatting to the guys down at my local hi-fi shop which was Reading Hi-Fi Centre obviously in Reading UK um, they said, "Oh, why don't you come and work here, mate?" And and, I, and yeah, just after a, after a few more weeks of frustration and stress at work, I just thought, you know what? Why the hell not? Um, so I did. I went to work there, and uh, of course, one of the perks was that I could buy um, hi-fi equipment, lovely hi-fi equipment at um, you know with 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 staff discounts, um, which was you know often you know a notable. A notable kind of uh, amount of discount, so uh, yeah, that that um, really kind of turbocharged my um, my buying ability. And of course, I was working with iVi every day, so I got to you know really got to used to trying things out, working out what I liked, what I wanted, where I was heading, etc. Uh, although you know, um, in the thirty five years I've worked in the industry, I've changed the direction of where I was heading in a sort of a hi fi context many a time. Uh, more on that later but um, anyway that sort of maybe sets the scene um, so yeah I worked in the industry in various roles um, from working in retail obviously where I started to working for manufacturers working as a distributor and um, for the last uh, 25 years working um, I, I started my own kind of PR, marketing, um, just hi-fi consultancy, basically. Um, and over the, over the more recent years, it's got more into sort of design and product consultancy, you know, product management and all sorts of things, um, just about every facet of the business you can imagine. Um, and, uh, and then really over the last 10 years, I've had a couple of kind of quite significant health sort of uh, hiccups, so to speak. And that kind of caused me to reevaluate things. And, and in that period of time, I really kind of um, compressed what I was doing in, in, the, in, the, in the day job, so to speak. And, and, and so that I just really just worked for companies that did, did things the way, uh, you know, made products that I really liked and, and, and people I really liked and all the rest of it. And I also started um, the Real to Real Rambler which um, was, was purely because, you know, I wanted to promote tape, um, you know, the, the sort of 15 IPS two channel tape as a as a viable medium. I had the skills to do it. Um, I didn't there were there were no clients willing to pay me to do that. But um, as I say, over the last sort of 10, 12 years, I, I, I moved away from that as the main driving force anyway. And, um, you know, just because it wasn't necessarily commercially viable, um, I just thought I want to tell people about what is genuinely uh, the best things out there, whether I get paid to or not. 
And that's kind of where I am, and that's why I started this, or, or, or you know, started working on this channel. And 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 so far, I've really been talking mostly about music. Um, uh, but um, anyway, in response to you know many requests, I'm going to talk about hi-fi today. So let's start running through the hi-fi system and um, start at the source. And my primary source, even with all the tape stuff, my primary source is without a doubt vinyl. Um, you know, I do think tape sounds better, obviously. Uh, vinyl, you know, if, you, if you've got a master tape, that's where the vinyl comes from. There is just no way in the, no way in the world that um, a vinyl uh, pressing of, a, of any given master tape is going to sound better than that master tape. Not in my opinion, anyway. I don't think you can... Um, improve upon the source so to speak so going um, going back to vinyl so my turntable is a clear audio master reference um, turntable and as I say I've had that for 16 years now since 2006 it's specifically the AMG wood version and um, if we take a look at it here you can see the um, you can see that it has these uh, aluminium slabs either side of uh, a Panzerholst layer. Panzerholst is um, basically bulletproof wood. Tank wood is the exact literal translation. Um, and it's an incredibly dense uh, ply, basically, uh, made under extremely high pressure. Uh, and is, is very, very, very acoustically dead. So you've got that sandwiched between the aluminium. And that's what constitutes the AMG wood version. Um, this has also got a CMB ceramic magnetic bearing fitted, which uh, removes the load point at the top of the, the thrust pad and load point at the top of the bearing. Um, and uh, in, in, in place of that, it's suspended on a magnetic field. So you effectively almost eliminate wear entirely and, 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 um, and at the same time noise in the bearing. Uh, but that, that was a subsequent upgrade that, that Clear Audio introduced and I subsequently fitted to my turntable. Um, and it sits on Clear Audio's Everest stand, which again, isn't made anymore, but this was made specifically to match the, uh, the master reference and is the, again, the AMG Wood version. Um, so yeah, I, you know, 16 years, that is the longest I've had any, any one turntable, to be honest. Um, before that I had a clear audio reference before that I had a Lin LP 12. Um, I've had a couple of Lins. I had four oracles. I've had Michelle's I've had, um, system decks. Um, I can't remember them all, but, but I've had a lot of turntables over the years and, uh, yeah, yeah. The fact I've had this one 16 years and have got absolutely no inclination to upgrade or change it whatsoever. It's pretty much, you know, testament to the to the quality of the product. And at the same time, I think that's what real high end hi fi is all about. You 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 buy something that is really, really, really well designed, well built, well thought out, well engineered, and it should last you a lifetime. And in that respect, it doesn't necessarily become the most expensive purchase that you ever made. It, it, it really does kind of um, alter the perception of the value. Now, tone arms. I've got two tone arms on here, and I've kind of mentioned this or alluded to this a few times, but uh, one for mono and one for stereo. I have a lot of um, original sort of early mono records from the sort of 50s and 60s. And um, I'm not quite sure how I can, maybe I should do a, a video on this specifically and go into it. I probably will do actually, if, you, if you'd like me to leave a message. But, you know, obviously I, I say I've worked in the industry for some time and it's, uh, um, you know, I've kind of canvassed a lot of the manufacturers I've worked with over the years to sort of take this is issue seriously. But um, mono records with a proper mono cartridge, and, and I say a proper mono cartridge, not a, bodged mono cartridge, not just a stereo cartridge that's sort of, you know, twisted through 22 and a half degrees or 45 degrees, whatever it would be, 45 degrees. Um, but a proper mono cartridge makes a world of difference 
with mono records, with original mono records. I mean, for starters, the groove size was different. Um, but, um, you know, I've had a a thousand pound mono cartridge up against a 10,000 pound stereo cartridge uh, with a mono original record and the mono cartridge walks it. It's not slightly better, it's in another league. And I would say a decent mono cartridge, um, a proper mono cartridge playing a mono record is actually the closest thing to master tape other than master tape. That's my opinion after experiencing it many, many, many times. Um, and if you're wondering, none of my current clients make any mono products whatsoever. This is, um, you know, like I say, I sort of, you know, a long time ago stopped working for companies I didn't believe in. So, you know, pretty much now it's, um, you know, you what you get is what you get from me and I'll, I'll tell it how it is. Anyway, so what are these arms and cartridges? Both cartridges are Miyajimas. The stereo one is a Kansui and the mono is uh, the zero mono with a one mil stylus incidentally there's two different styli sizes but again depending for the era of mono records that you want to fine tune it for in an ideal world i'd have both uh, and the tone arms uh, or pickup arms depending on how uh, pedantic you want to be um, the stereo one is the glans mh124s and my mono arm is a Schick 12. I mean, both actually are stereo arms, but I could, you know, I've, I've just using them for those different purposes. Um, and the kind of the important thing about these arms are they are high effective mass, which is kind of required for the cartridges that I'm using, which are kind of old school. These days, nearly all cartridges are high compliance. I think is how you, I always get this muddled up. Um, high compliance for which you need a low mass tone arm, low effective mass tone arm. Um, but um, these are very old school cartridges and uh, it just, it, it, it's, um, it works really, really, really well. It suits me down to the ground. Um, I don't actually use either of the uh, head shells they come with. I'll, on the, on the, um, the Schick, I use a Shunmuk head shell which is made out of Mpingo wood. And on the um, glands, I use an Autophon LH8000 head shell, which is, um, I believe it's a Yurushi lacquered oak head shell. And both of them have got sort of um, homemade arm boards out of um, Mpingo wood. And uh, again, more than happy to make a more in-depth, detailed, video about turntables, tone arms, arm boards, and all the rest of it. But again, there is a reason for this. Um, and it's a reason I've, you know, it's just something I've gathered over the years um, about mechanical mismatches between materials. And there are so many companies that just get this wrong, in my opinion. Um, you, you may know many, many, many moons ago when the Riga RB300 came out, which is a great tone arm. I've owned two or three of them over the years. Um, that Lynn famously kind of like, oh, it's terrible, it won't work on our turntable, blah, 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 blah. I actually totally disagree. I think it worked really well on an LP12 turntable. And an LP12 tone arm, if you think about it, is uh, MDF um, laminated on either side with, with like a hard, you know, I mean, melamine type of laminate, which is exactly the same construction as a Riga RBR good grief, a Riga Planar 3, which was the turntable it was initially designed for uh, as the chassis of that. And I think that's really key. Um, and I think the reason that Lynn started that rumour is purely because it was such a damn good turntable. They'd never have sold any more, sorry, tone arm. They'd never have sold any more tone arms. Um, in, in contrast, you put the Riga on a hard acrylic or metal arm board, and I've had it on, I've tried it now. Well, I have had it on an Oracle and on um, on a uh, Michelle turntable in both instances. Now, again, it's something that's very commonly sold or was back in the day. And I'm afraid I think it sounds hard and glassy and it's a real mechanical mismatch. But um, there we go. I could witter on, get sidetracked and witter on for hours and hours and hours. So I'll try not to. Um, 
Vinyl peripherals, which I will mention because I think they're all really quite important. So record cleaning. I clean every single record that comes into the house. I don't clean them every time I play them by any means. Um, I might re-clean something if I get fingerprints on it or just if it's been left out overnight, I forget to put it away or something. But I clean everything that comes in. And I use a Lorrycraft PRC6, which uh, you can see here. Um, I've had this for about seven years. Um, I genuinely don't think it's the best record cleaner in the world. I do think that these um, sonic or ultrasonic cleaners work better, but this is a very good record cleaner. And at some point I might get um, a sonic or ultrasonic one to either supplement it or replace it, but it's, it's not top priority. I think with this, I mean, you know, sometimes I'll give things two or three cleans um, to get it really, really well cleaned. But uh, the most important thing about this and all record cleaners, I believe, is the efficiency of the drying mechanism. One thing you absolutely can't do in my book is air dry, leave things to air dry because or or, or hot air dry worse still, because of course, you know, the the sonic version, the um you know vortices sort of building up which is kind of how these work uh, basically that moves fluid whatever fluid you're using and that's another key element around in the groove to sort of loosen solids you know greases particles whatever put them in suspension in the fluid and then you've got to get that fluid off if you leave that fluid to then evaporate all that happens is the muck just goes back on the record all you've done is moved it around that's um it's so th the um, the Lorrycraft PRC6 of all of the Lorrycrafts and all of the Keith Monks, I think I can pretty much say that uh, factually. Um, uh, I, I, I certainly used to know where Keith Monks and Lorrycraft got their vacuum pumps from, and I got this information from the pump manufacturer. But uh, it, the one in the Lorrycraft uses um, it has got the highest suction rate. Uh, and that was what was important to me. Um, quite controversially, I'm sure, I use a, Verit a Furatec DMAG Alpha. Now this, I use literally before every single play. And if I don't, I can hear it. And it's one of those crazy things. It kind of works in a similar way. You put your vinyl on, you press a button, and it goes through a little cycle. I think it's about 20 seconds. I mean, you can see here maybe. Um, but it works in the same way as the old TV screen degaussers used to work. Uh, it applies a an oscillating magnetic kind of field to the vinyl, um, which which diminishes um, over over the course of this sort of twenty seconds or so. Same way as a head demagnetizer works on a, on a tape deck as well. Um, and obviously, the the issue is you know that that demagnetizer's work is not rocket science. That's just proven fact that vinyl records can hold a magnetic field, hold magnetic charge, whatever the correct term is, um, and it makes a sonic difference. That's that's the bit that has people scratching their beards and, um, you know, getting into a rage sometimes. And, um, you know, the fact of the matter is I do, you know, I, I work for Furitech, I've done for several years, and I do their, I certainly do their UK pay, KPR, sorry, UK PR, and I do some worldwide consultancy for them too. Uh, and I know what it says in the, the you know, the, the, the websites. I know what it says in reviews. And it's all about the carbon black that can hold it. And, and that may be the case. Um, but, you know, the honest truth of that is, and, and I, you know, this is the fact of why classic records, I think, moved away from black vinyl. Um, because the classic records used one. They've been around for some time. I know two or three reviewers who have got them, who have, uh, you know, who have bought them, paid money for them. Um, because, you know, once you've tried one and heard it, it's like, oh, gee, God, you know, you, you, you can't unhear it. Um, and um, it's, it's a really interesting thing. But anyway, I, 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 I bring into question the carbon black thing because I just, you know, I mean, obviously recently I've, I've, I've done some reviews of these new UHQRs you could still hear the benefit of demagnetizing them. And, and, you know, that's pretty much why they use Clarity Vinyl. But Clarity Vinyl is not immune to the benefits of being demagnetized. So, again, 
more than happy to do um, in-depth videos on vinyl treatments, if you like, we could call this. Um, but I'll move on from the DMAG. Um, I know some of you, I know one of you will, uh, will, 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 will know this because I've done the demo for one or one or two of you and you've gone out and bought them. Um, but anyway, I also use uh, an AFI Flat 2 uh, record flattening machine here, which you can see. Um, I've tried several record flattening machines. None of them work 100% of the time, but this one is the most effective that I've come across. And um, um, warped records is a real pet hate of mine. So um, yeah, I kind of had to get this really. Um, I've only had that for a couple of years or a year or so, a couple of years probably. So um, yeah. Uh, the AFI Flat 2 record flattening device. Um, and then um, for static, I've, I've actually got a few things here. Um, the one I've had the longest is the uh, Furatech D-STAT. Um, I think I had a D-STAT. The one I have is a D-STAT 3, as you can see here. Works really, really well. Um, I also have an SK filter, which... Um, the benefit of that over the DSTAT 3 is that actually works while the record is playing. So it's continuously sort of dissipating static while the record is playing. Um, but it's a bit of an ergonomic um, pain in the butt, so to speak. And so I've recently got this uh, DS Audio Ion 001, which is kind of works in a similar way to the Furistat DSTAT 3, but you position it by your turntable. Uh, I need to make a bracket for this, so I, it's not it's not permanently by my turntable, but you position it by the turntable and actually it floods the record with, um, you know, a carefully balanced sort of, you know, charged airstream continuously while the record is playing. Um, so it's kind of like a DSTAT 3 and an SK filter combined. Again, not cheap, but uh, you know, it's the most thorough solution to the issue, which is a real issue. And I, I mentioned with 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 you know with the magnetization with static, it's not just attracting dust. It's not pops and clicks that people. Oh, I can hear the static pops and clicks. Well, I don't know that you can. What I hear is a a veiling like a, a grey. Um, neck curtain pulled across in front of the the, the sound stage, um, a muffling to it, all of the details. And you've got to you've got to think that your your, your pickup pickup cartridge. Uh, let's say we're talking about a moving coil cartridge. It's an incredibly incredibly sensitive electromagnetic um, measurement device. Let us say. And if you are asking it to operate, uh, you know, let's say the coils and the magnets are maybe two millimeters from the record surface, it'll depend on your cantilever length and setup of your turntable, etc. But um, say you're operating within two millimeters of the record surface, and you've got this piece of vinyl revolving in air, which which creates friction. All of this creates static. The 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 magnet itself of the cartridge being being, being rotated around the record. It, it, it's you know, if you could look into a micro world of sort of electromagnetism, um, you'd be, you know, it's basically, it's kind of trying to read the, um, this information in a, you know, the equivalent of an electromagnetic London smog of the uh, 19th century. So to deal with these things, it just makes, it makes everything clearer um, and more easy to listen to, far more enjoyable. So really things worth investigating I would suggest and again on the note of um, demagnetization cartridge operation all the rest of it uh, another little tool, tool I have is the Aesthetics ABCD1 cartridge demagnetizer only for use on moving coil cartridges I don't know exactly how it works uh, I think it probably does the same sort of uh, uh, oscillating from positive to negative um, electrical signal that sort of fades gradually away uh, but again you demagnetize a moving coil cartridge that you've maybe been using for anything from sort of three months or longer I mean typically you, you know say you've had it a year or two years or three years even you will absolutely recognize the difference it's like having a new cartridge almost so again 
um, a very useful and kind of unique box. Um, they aesthetics make them. They used to also license. I don't know if they still do, but they um, made them. Uh, you know, supplied them OEM to uh, Benz. I think Benz sold this same product, uh, but it was it's actually manu designed and manufactured by aesthetics. Um, what else can we mention on LP peripherals? Um, DS Audio ST50 stylus cleaner. I also have the um, Onzo, I um, can't think what it's called, Zero Dust, which is softer than the ST50. And I use that less frequently, but the, the, the stylus sinks further into it. So it's good for getting muck off the, um, the kind of the shaft of the diamond, if you like. Um, and I know there's been scare stories about these in the, in the news over the last year or two. Um, I, I, frankly, I don't understand it. I mean, I've, I've, you know, I have checked my style under a microscope now and then, uh, but I've been using these things for, for quite a few years now. And I have, I can't see any negative effects whatsoever. I think there's, you know, them leaving sticky residue on the, uh, on the stylus is is highly debatable um there are obviously there are many of these you know sticky stylus cleaners around so some i can't speak for every model out there but um i say the ds audio st50 and the onzo um i've used for ages and, and no problem whatsoever and then quite recently i've picked up this uh black ravioli record ground which um kind of works in a um, it, it, it's sold as a record ground, not a record clamp. It's, um, you know, working on the vinyl surface rather than um, trying to mate the turntable to the turn, the record to the turntable. So it's an interesting product that I think works well. And anyway, we'll leave the turntable now, but go to the very much associated product, equally important in my opinion, uh, the phono stage. And, um, the four, third in a row aesthetics phono stage that I've owned. Um, I started off with a Raya, which is their base model, and just worked my way up their range, uh, leapfrogging a few steps to the um, aesthetics IO Eclipse uh, VC with volume control version, which again I've had for 12, well, since 2010, so 12 to 13 years. Um, it's pretty much top of their range and it's it's pretty much a state of the art phono stage. It's, it comes in two boxes, separate power supply, fully dual mono, fully valve, valve power supply. I think there's 24 valves, tubes if you're stateside, 24 tubes in the whole thing, all, all valve gain, no transformers. And it sounds blindingly good. It really, really, really does. Anyway, so that's vinyl. Now we'll go on to tape, uh, my second medium, if you like. Now, this sort of started in 2014 with the uh, R Technics RS1500, which I bought off uh, my friend Dave Corley um, of uh, Time Step. Um, I find time, time Step Distribution, they manufactured some products too and distribute some products. Uh, I worked with him for a, few, a couple of years, not, not, for, not for some time now, but... Um, he was the first person that demonstrated tape to me as, uh, you know, oh my God, this is a serious medium uh, by playing me his RS-1500. And, and, and frankly, it was only a matter of months before I got him to build me. I mean, he, re he used to rebuild them. Uh, so I got him to rebuild me one and, uh, and, and bought that off of him and was, was just delighted with it. And then I discovered the joys of 15 inch per second, two track kind of master copies. Um, the first two tapes I got was a, an Opus 3 demo reel and a Horch House um, Oscar Peterson master copy. And they absolutely blew my mind. Um, and, and then again, also off Dave Corey, I got the first of my Studas, which are, I mean, Studa, is the professional leg of Revox, if you like. They're, they're owned by the same company. Revox are domestic with pro products, Studer are professional products. And the 807 was sort of bottom of their range, but, you know, bottom of a studio, you know, say master recorder, they, you could use them for mastering, they were used in studios. 
my particular one was um, originally owned by Classic FM. Uh, and interestingly enough, I will be putting this up for sale. I mean, it's up for sale now, frankly. If anyone's interested, do send me a uh, send me a private message if you can do that on YouTube. I don't know. Um, if uh, if you can't, it's davidenure at mac dot com. Um, but um, yeah, send me a message if you're interested. Uh, it would need to be in the UK because I don't, really don't want to start shipping it internationally. But uh, it's an astonishing machine, and good though the Technics is, it blows it out of the water. Uh, but I was so taken with that that, um, you know, only a couple of years later in 2017, I got the uh, Studer A812, original owner's um, London Weekend Television. And um, yeah, that's this is in contrast to the 807, this is two steps down from the top of their range. Um, a significantly better machine, does all four speeds, so up to 30 IPS and um we'll we'll take sort of 12 inch reels um so just more versatile and and a higher quality still and then just very recently this year um and my excuse for buying this was was because i've got a, an upcoming work project which i'm working on with some record producer mastering engineer label owners friends and um you know we may be making you know launching a new brand if you like of uh, uh you know master tape copies 15 ips two track reel to reel tape um albums um which would be incredibly fun and uh, you know yeah that was all the justification i needed to go out and buy the a80 and of course the a80 vu this one here this is the original a80 vu first introduced in 1970 and the original owner of this this was bought by EMI and was used at their Hayes plant in Middlesex, which, uh, you know, zillions and zillions of records would have been pressed there over the years. So, you know, the mind boggles at what albums will have been mastered on this machine or the, the masters played on this machine. Um, so, you know, yeah, it, it, in my view, it doesn't really get any better than this. Peripherals on the tape. Well, I use a combination of Studer and Dark Lab hubs, NAB hubs, um, and uh, I use a Handy Mag D Mag, D Magnetizer, and um, I use RX reels, carbon fiber take up reels. That that's um, you know for a combination really of their absolute flatness and the. Um, delightful sort of what do we call it I, I did i did help them out with some pr on that just just on their launch they're not an ongoing client um but um you know i'm always keen to sort of help out small companies who are trying to get into the you know I, that's what floats my boat really it's sort of small interesting companies trying to do something new i i, I cannot be bothered working for companies now that just you know release a new product every year because you know, that's what the market wants, you know, slap an SE on it and change the color of an NED and call it a new product. I'm not into that. Anyway, I digress again. Good at that. So here we go. So that's, um, well, no, I say that's my analog sources, digital sources, right? Um, digital has always been a kind of a, a second class medium for me. And um, so I've, I've always found it kind of hard to, gen you know, to, you know, I'm contemplating buying a sort of a, you know, fancy DAC or a fancy CD player. And then, you know, I'll end up buying a new cartridge, a phono cartridge or a tone arm or something instead. So digital, my um, my digital player, if you like, is actually a Mac Mini running. Um, I've got Audio Varna on there and I've also got Rune on there. Um, Rune is more convenient and, and more ergonomically nice. I think Audio Varna sounds better personal taste um, that runs into a CAD 1543 deck um, and uh, it that's a it's it's a it's one of my favorite decks it's um, it's very 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 minimalist it doesn't even have an on off button it's only got one input so you know there's literally no controls on it at all um, and um, 
you know it doesn't doesn't it has no upsampling no oversampling no digital filter at all um and uh but it just sounds the most analog and 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 you know on extended listening it just it just sounds nice and works and um i like it for that uh i i often from 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 a from you know on behalf of my day job i, I have other dax here sort of on loan uh, i've currently got an aesthetics romulus eclipse which is a magnificent DAC uh, but I don't own it it's not mine it's not on you know it's just on loan um, anyway the Mac Mini CAD DAC um, duo is sort of uh, backed up with I, I use a CAD ground control on the Mac Mini and uh, a CAD um, USB cable to connect the two and uh, a brand new product actually which uh, hasn't even been press released yet but you know i've got i've got one <laughs> hasn't been launched but it's uh so a bit of a spoiler here but here we go a cad usb control which is a little small plug-in device which goes into a spare usb socket and believe me it makes an improvement that's even in addition to putting a ground control on and a usb cable so that's my digital um speakers oh amplifiers excuse me amplifiers um since 2014 so night for nine years now all my amplification has been aesthetics um prior to that i've used a combination of aesthetics gamut and icon audio um and then go you know for probably the preceding five years and then going back i uh, you know i had name name all the way up to sort of 135s 52 preamp and, and the like um and uh you know various other brands um going further and further back in time and uh and i've tried some i've had some really really interesting uh one-off prototypes which never went to market which uh, again if you're interested and you'd like to know you know i could do a an amplifiers video one day and maybe talk about some of these because you know some of them were quite fun um you know and sounded unbelievable but i was under strict instructions from the designers you know who were obviously they were that was day job clients at the time you know like oh, i was taking home a prototype to give it a listen and they would say things like you know don't you know if it's monoblocks turn them on one at a time and um don't play them for more than three hours you know uh turn it off after three hours and don't leave the room while they're on and you know in case they blow up and burn my house down but um you know many of them um sounded flawed in certain respects but some of them unbelievable in others uh and it would yeah it'd be fun to talk about some of those um not quite sure you know i'm sure it'd be cool to talk about even though they like i say they never made it to market uh one or two of them i did plead with the uh the the company in question the designer in question to sell me the prototype but they wouldn't uh you know because <laughs> because i just wanted that sound health and safety is you know blow that um anyway so yeah uh, amplifiers aesthetics my preamp the line stage is the calypso eclipse like the phono stage i started out with just the aesthetics calypso uh the cool thing about these is they, they they've made subsequent upgrades but they are entirely retrofitable so i have my calypso when they bought out the calypso signature um i was able to send my calypso standard back um and uh get it upgraded to signature and then when they brought out the calypso eclipse it went back again and got upgraded to calypso eclipse uh, i can't remember the years that i did the various upgrades but uh, it's it's now at the uh, you know the top of the calypso tree uh, so that's a calypso eclipse line stage all valve again um and uh my power amp is the atlas signature atlas signature stereo uh because they do a mono version too um i actually bought that as the signature version um to my ears it was significantly better than the standard atlas um and it was that that, that was that that signaled my change from what i was using previously which was actually a pair of Icon Audio 845 Mark II monoblocks. Uh, that was what signified me switching from those to the Atlas signature. And interestingly enough, I have actually uh, ordered, and I'm just in the waiting list basically, for um, that to be upgraded to an Atlas Eclipse. 
which includes a whole new earthing system, new, 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 you know, a whole new, it's pretty much a new amplifier, but it, it, it's, I mean, it, in, the, in that case, it is actually a new chassis and everything. So that's amplifiers. Uh, and then lastly, of the main components before cables and all the rest is speakers. And my speakers I've had for two or three years now. And I'm pretty sure these were, I think these were the first production samples. Uh, because before this, I had two different pre-production samples. Uh, and they care, the Kerr Acoustic K100 Mark II. And I got involved with Jess Kerr when he was um, just starting up. And uh, I heard his first original pair of prototypes of these K100s, and they just blew my socks off. Um, they're designed as full range studio monitors. And basically I work with him, uh, I, I don't work with him anymore. I just work with him sort of for the first couple of years to sort of fine tune the product range and get him lined up ready for launch really. Um, and he's now moved on and, and you know, we may do some more stuff together in the future. I don't know, but you know we're still friends, and um, you know I still love the speakers. Uh, but yeah, they're they're full range um, studio monitors, uh, twelve inch volt bass driver, um, and uh, I think it's a five inch volt dome mid range, and I think it's a four inch, maybe five inch uh, ribbon tweeter. And they are, they are actually a third wave um, transmission line, and I think that's quite important. The third wave rather than a quarter wave, which is what most people do. To me, it's got a lot more dynamic um, swing and openness to it than a quarter wave. I think that's. Uh, I'm not a speaker designer, right? But I, you know, I'll often be involved in in listening. You know. Um, People bring prototypes around, clients bring prototypes around and, we'll, you know, I'll sit there with the designer listening. And that's, you know, again, that's part of the reason how my system's been, how it's been used over the last 20 odd years. So, that's you know, that's kind of why it is as it is. Um, anyway, um, because the Kerrs are really a studio loudspeaker, or that initially they are, and, and, and studio loudspeakers and domestic loudspeakers are kind of a little bit different um, in so much as domestic speakers are designed to work in living rooms, studios are will be almost always acoustically designed and treated, um, and uh, and it's 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 partly because of that that uh, you, well, you know I've treated my room, um, and it, you know also it's partly I've been hanging out with you know recording engineers, record producers, mastering engineers, etc. Over the last few years, as my interest in tape has kind of taken me in that in that way to some degree and um yes yeah, so i've 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 really treated the room quite heavily and it, heavily it's all uh, gik acoustics um treatments and uh, as you can see here i've got uh i've got bass traps in um in in all four of the corners in different forms um and uh, i've got um uh, what would you call absorbers behind the speakers on the front wall, the back wall? I never know what to call front and back walls. Um, and then I've got quite significant thick ones behind my head uh, on the rear wall, I suppose you would call it. I don't know. Um, and uh, bass traps on the ceiling too. And um, it makes a vast amount of difference. So basically what you're doing is you're taking the room as far as possible out of the equation. Now you kind of do that. Uh, you then need to really drive the speakers with a lot of energy to get that, you know, um, to get the enjoyment back, if you like. Um, but of course, that's what a studio monitor will do. And, you know, you've got to drive it properly. Um, and, you know, so now, I mean, you know, I've got a phenomenal dynamic open uh the, you know the sound staging goes i mean you know miles beyond the extremities of the of the room um it's 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 quite remarkable um and uh you know you it, it's it's worth investigating these i mean the whole extent of the room treatments in this room is maybe two or three grand at most it's it's not very expensive 
for the, you know, if you've got a £10,000 system, you really, really, really ought to look at, you know, just try some because it will make a difference. Um, you, you know, you need to be careful with it because it, it's, it's you know, if you over damp, you just kill it. So you need to do it, you know, bit by bit, listen, move things around, listen again, move things around, listen again. And then wherever possible, less is more. So sort of take stuff away until you start to get problems and then put that little bit back. Anyway, that's um, that's the room treatment, which I guess is, uh, yeah, we can think of that as a major part of the room because believe me, the room is a major part of what you're listening to. All of you, are, I'm sure. Um, uh, you know, and apart from those of you who are listening in, in studios. Um, and then we've got peripherals. I've mentioned before uh, the, the, the CAD ground controls. I mean, I've, I've really got into these things. Um, they are a client, but they kind of became a client because, you know, we, 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 we had a brief working kind of relationship and, and um, these things came along and, and it just blew me away, frankly. Um, and I've got, I've got two GC3s. One of those is actually out on loan with a friend and five GC1s. And I use them on my, I've got GC3 on the mains earth and uh, GC1s spread around the system on, um, on the, uh, the signal plane um, earth, signal ground. Um, and one, interestingly, I ought to mention, on the, um, the ground plane of, the, uh, of my ethernet switch which makes a big difference, a really big difference to the digital listening. Um, what other peripherals of note? Townsend seismic podiums under the loudspeakers. Again, these things that need to be heard to be believed. Um, uh, I'll just go back to the mains I talked about. I mean, I've, I use Furatech mains plugs and, and sockets uh, throughout. Um, for, the, for what they cost, they make a massive amount of difference. They really do. And again, I know there's people out there who just laugh and scoff or get downright angry about the suggestion that mains plugs and cables and sockets and things make a difference. Um, and really, I think they just need to, uh, to to listen, frankly, because if they can't, you know, I have heard systems where they don't make a difference. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to add that. You know, I've, all these peripheral things, I've heard systems where they don't make a difference. And I would suggest that the reason they don't make a difference is because the system's so opaque that you can't hear the difference. Um, because in very, very, very many systems, you put these things in, the, dis the difference is profound. Um, you won't always like it, you know. I mean, for a take, make their plugs and sockets in rhodium um, or gold and, and one or two of them in silver plating. I use the rhodium plated and I can, I know people who prefer the sound of the gold plated and I can fully understand why. Now, if they make no difference, that would be a really bizarre thing to say, wouldn't it? But yeah, they do make a difference. They make a big difference. Cables are a, 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 a select, well, a, a different speaker cables are Townsend F1 fractals. Um, Interconnects are a combination of Gamut, Furatech and Townsend. Mains cables are a combination of um, Gamut and uh, Isotech and Connected Fidelity, nearly forgot to mention. And I also use a Connected Fidelity AC 2K balanced mains transformer, currently just on the reel-to-reel -reel machines. Um, but even that, you know, at certain times I'll take them out. It just depends. It's, uh, but it's, it's an interesting product. It's an interesting product. But all mains conditioning, I'm very wary of. I mean, it certainly makes a difference. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that it doesn't for a moment. But most of these things, like anything, is swings and roundabouts. And it's whether the difference is a, an out-and-out improvement or a slight improvement here and a uh, degradation there. And um, yeah, that's that's yeah. So that's that's where I'm at on mains conditioning. But um, yeah, the AC the AC two K from Connected Fidelity is just a, a very large, balanced um, mains transformer, uh, which gives your mains. You know, you get a balanced mains supply, um, and um, 
you know that reduces noise on the mains by by phase cancellation uh, it's not rocket science it's quite basic electronic theory um and again it really is a case of you know do you prefer it or don't you prefer it um I definitely don't prefer it on my power amp, but on the source components and preamps, it, it, it definitely makes improvements, which I, I like. Uh, but, you know, the jury's out a little out on that. And um, I think that pretty much covers the entire system. So, as I say, um, you know, whether it's turntables, whether it's, um, you know, the, the, my history of turntables, what I've, what I've had in the past, um, my, my feelings on arm boards and, you know, materials, you know, wood arm boards versus aluminium ones versus acrylic ones. It all depends on the turn, uh, turntable and the tone arm, in my opinion. Um, you know, linear trackers, um, I've, I've owned two of those, um, cartridges moving coils moving magnets optical cartridges obviously one of my main clients is ds audio um i will mention actually that ds audio have got a very interesting product the es001 which i have had at home i mean it's a client i have had at home uh sadly i've only had it home for a for like a day or two at a time um and that cor that basically use that to correct the uh eccentricity of your vinyl and it's interesting i believe the riaa spec or it maybe it's the aes spec for vinyl eccentricity is uh I'm, i've you know i could be corrected here but for argument's sake let's say it's uh 25 microns i can't remember but for argument's sake say it is um that is definitely audible in, in, in terms of sort of like, um, you know, speed, stability and, and resultant focus to the soundstage and, and sort of dynamic snappiness of the music. So that's a product that, um, you know, obviously I've done the PR on it and it's getting some interesting reviews here, there and, and, and everywhere. But uh, I do actually want to try that myself. Um, and... Um, yeah, I strongly suspect that will go that will go onto the shopping list at some point. Um, and uh, and I do, you know, I don't, I haven't tried the optical cartridges in uh, in you know in earnest at home. Um, but again, they're very, 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 very interesting devices. Um, but that's kind of you know that's that's something for the future. But I'd be yeah anyway. I mean, you know, whether it's record cleaning, record treatments, turntable setup my view on turntables my history of turntables tapes amplifiers crazy you know prototype amps um digital um speakers whatever let me know what you'd like to uh, hear about i'm always happy to to chat about anything really and um i hope that was of interest I um I hope to not, not not too many of you are seething at the thought of uh, magnetized vinyl or mains cables making differences or all that malarkey. Um, uh, basically, I just go by what I hear, um, and that's really how I uh, how I've sort of worked my way through life and my audio life and my hi-fi life, um, and ended up with the system I have. So anyway, again I digress. I will say cheerio for now. Thank you very 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 much for watching. And uh, I'll catch you all soon. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.